G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy at the conclusion of round four, which uh, again was an interesting round. I know it's a cliche thing to say after a round of footy, oh, gee, that was interesting. But again, it was another round that's really sort of challenged some of the beliefs that I had around certain teams, you know, started to naively think that I uh, maybe had a good feel about which teams were going to be good this year, which teams weren't. Uh, I got five out of nine on the tipping. It felt like less, to be honest, because it was a generally surprising round, and uh, I'm still trying to work out what to make of some of the performances. We will go through that in this video, and we'll uh, take a look at the nine games that happened, and uh, my general thoughts on them. As I said, I don't always get to watch every single game. In particular, this weekend, I, uh, I had to work, but we'll go through some of the results that occurred on the weekend. Before we crack into it, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, it still looks like we're trending in the wrong direction in terms of subscribers, guys. There's still about 41% of you who watch the videos and subscribe to the channel as well so it's actually creeping in the wrong direction so if you could help me out and if you're enjoying the content make sure you hit subscribe but enough of that let's get straight into it the round opened up with Port Adelaide hosting Melbourne on uh, Thursday night it was I sort of touched on a little bit of Port's performance in my last video last week which was uh, highlighting teams that had surprised us so far in 2022 and you know since that I think almost all the teams I mentioned lost in this round but moving on from that you can probably get some of my more uh, in-depth thoughts on Port Adelaide in particular in that video if you want to go check that out but on the paper just a terrible terrible loss to only kick your first goal late in the third term at home in front of a crowd that was uh, a little bit bemused even by the standard of this season they're not playing great footy to only kick one goal in the first three quarters uh it was it must have been a terrible game to be at it wasn't a great standard of footy uh from either side to be honest just wasn't one of those games where either side was getting a hold of their opportunities and melbourne won the game by 32 points but it felt like they were dominating a lot more but when the winning side only kicks you know, 68 is their final score, kind of speaks to a really scrappy performance. And just to make matters worse for Port Adelaide, and we know they've got the, the injury sort of situation at the moment, and uh, that's only getting worse with Ollie Wines. I'm uh, not no idea how long he's going to miss, but he's got a bit of myocarditis as well, which is a concern on a whole number of fronts, but hopefully he is all right. Then on the Friday night, Geelong hosted the Brisbane Lions, a uh, potential finals preview. You'd think both of these sides will feature in September this year, Geelong getting the W by 10 points at home. I tipped that correctly, just felt that, you know, even though Brisbane probably the better side in my eyes, Geelong were very, very hard to beat at GMHBA, and they proved too strong once again. A little bit of commentary around that game, uh, around the, the umpiring decisions. I didn't see all of those other than uh, the Tom Hawkins one. And people seem to think that uh, the Lions were robbed a little bit. Perhaps that's true. But, uh, you know, if you look at the stats across that game, it looks like Geelong, I, I just felt they were more dangerous, and the stats sort of suggest that as well, having far more inside 50s. And overall, not too much to take out of the game in terms of uh, learning about either side. It's a good win for Geelong to notch, keeping themselves relevant this year. And for Brisbane, it's their first loss of the season, and it's one of the toughest fixtures in footy. So I wouldn't say it's a particular game that we, we learned a lot about. But one thing's for sure, Geelong's dangerous forward line, uh, it's just so difficult to, to fully lock down. When you've got both Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins in that same side, you know, you shut down one, you've got to worry about the other one. Jeremy Cameron was great last week, only kicked one goal in this game, but sure enough, Tom Hawkins bobs up and kicks five of his own. So like a few other sides, you know, even when they're not necessarily playing well, good key forwards can drag you across the line, and uh, Tom Hawkins certainly did that for his side on Friday. Then in the Sydney North game, I admit I didn't watch a whole lot of this game because it was at the same time as my beloved West Coast Eagles, but uh, Sydney definitely got a big scare at home against a side that I've sort of been talking about as probably the worst in terms of exposed form this year, North Melbourne, but put up a very spirited performance. Jack Zebel went forward, kicked five goals out of nowhere. They finished the game with 12 goals, three, deadly accurate, and uh, led the game for, I don't know how long they, they led the game, but they were certainly in front uh, deep into that last quarter, and it took a, a big finish from someone like Isaac Heaney in particular, to drag this ones across the line. So for them, it's just a case of they've made a great escape. They nearly got embarrassed at home by last year's Wooden Spooners. And for North Melbourne, that's a huge step in the right direction to travel to the SCG and almost knock off a very good team in Sydney. We also probably saw Jason Horn Francis's best game at the level. Looked very, very comfortable. Certainly had his best fantasy score, which really caught my attention. Uh, but good to see him uh, really sort of start to take a bit of a step. Then you had Collingwood and the West Coast Eagles at Marvel Stadium. And uh, if you tuned into the live stream, that I did at the time, you would have seen my reaction and how stoked I was with that unexpected result. I genuinely felt like the Pies had 
the that had the tools to really put away the Eagles, who uh, were quite indifferent against Fremantle, I thought. But they certainly looked a bit fresher coming into this game, and, and from start to finish, really looked up for the contest. I think it would be unfair to uh, to suggest that you know that West Coast ever dominated proceedings at all. It felt like Collingwood sort of had their opportunities, some poor ball inside 50. They weren't great at taking their opportunities, and and on the flip side, West Coast transitioned the ball out of the back half really, really efficiently, and we saw guys like Nation in particular really catch my eye as someone who was dangerous coming out of the back half, which is something we haven't seen in a couple of years, to be honest. At the end of the day, when one side kicks 14 goals three, uh, they've given themselves the best opportunity to win the game, and that is ultimately what happened with the Eagles uh, recording for one of the one of the better wins in club history when you consider the context of you know all the players missing and all that. But in Collingwood's defense, it was just one of those days where I don't think they played horridly. They certainly didn't play their best footy, and they were unlucky West Coast pulled out a very, very good performance considering their outs. So long term, is this a massive blow? No, but it is. Uh, you can understand why they'd be dejected with that result because it really felt like Collingwood had the potential to do something this year, and that may still be the case. But to go down to a side that uh, has looked nowhere really near getting four points this year, it's really, really deflating. So that was the first surprising result of the round for me, and that was followed by uh, not an equally surprising one, but one that was uh, a surprise to me nonetheless. Richmond getting the better of the Bulldogs by 38 points, and Richmond is another team that's just very hard to get a read on. You know, the week before, they get dumped by the Saints by five goals, and it doesn't really look like they're a genuine top eight team just yet to me, but to beat last year's grand final aside in the Western Bulldogs by 38 points suggests that they're still definitely dangerous. Again, statistically, the Bulldogs sort of, uh, you would think, had the better of the play looking at uh, the stats. You know, some of most of the major ball winners were Bulldogs players. They uh, had more inside 50s, but again, Richmond were just so efficient at making the most of their opportunities. And conversely, the Bulldogs put up seven goals, 19, and any time you kick seven goals, 19 in a game, you're very, very lucky to win. As such, it's the Bulldogs now we've got to look at and say, gee, they've blown some opportunities in the opening rounds with just the one win so far in 2022 coming against the Sydney Swans. I still think they're a good team, but to be one and three at the moment, it doesn't really sort of demonstrate the fact that they should be a good team. And to be only percentage ahead of West Coast after four rounds, it really shows that they've... Uh, they should be doing better. It's not panic stations for me yet, but this is a bad result for a side that should be well and truly aiming for the top four. Then Fremantle hosted the GWS Giants at Optus Stadium on Saturday night, getting the better of them by uh, about six goals in the end, actually. It was quite a close contest for most of the game. I think they led by one point through maybe midway through the final quarter before eventually just turning on the Jets. And frankly, GWS didn't quite have any answers for what Fremantle were able to produce. Sean Darcy came back into the side, but Caleb Sarong didn't. And uh, though those were the two players that I was interested in seeing whether they would be picked as to whether I would pick Fremantle and end up tipping them correctly. But it was a good showing from uh, some maybe fringe players and some certainly some youth to step up into the void at Fremantle who have a concentration of injuries around their midfield, but their new recruit, Will Brody, stepped up and I think 36 possessions, his highest tally at AFL level as well. So it's a good win for Fremantle and I think a, a more convincing result than perhaps their derby performance really demonstrated, but they'll be hoping to build some momentum. And on the other side of the coin, GWS, again, just one win from four games, only percentage ahead of West Coast. And I use West Coast as a metric for a team that had really fallen out of finals calculations. But the fact that GWS and the Bulldogs are not that far apart shows that there's a real evenness to this comp. But it's been a disappointing opening four rounds for a side that I think is capable of more. To have notched just one victory over the Gold Coast Suns so far this year, that's not quite good enough for me. Then on to the Sunday games, Essendon took on Adelaide earlier today and got the job done by four points. This game was probably closer than I expected. I did think there was potential for an Adelaide upset, but surely on paper, Essendon should be a side that can put them away by at least five goals. Instead, it was a good contest. We saw the return of Tex Walker back into the side and immediately picks up more or less where he left off with some really good form, kicking four goals for the away side and they nearly stole the victory. And I guess talking about Adelaide first, they've kind of had a really good start to the season where they haven't won enough games yet to sort of really impact what their draft pick is going to be at the end of the year, but I think showed some really good signs as a footy club. In particular, Josh Rochelle, the young star who was taken with pick six last year. I think he's playing some really, really impressive footy and I think unexpectedly playing very well very early. For the Bombers, they can breathe a sigh of relief. It hasn't been the most convincing start to this season for a side, again, that should be aiming for finals based on last year's performances. They were very, very close to being 0-4 and, uh, you know, potentially out of the finals race before the season really gets up and cranking. So Parrish was BOG for them, uh, another 38 possessions for him, unsurprising. And Peter Wright is turning into a very consistent forward for them as well. Another player that I'll, I'll keep mentioning for as long as he keeps playing as well as he has. So to get that player for a what was effectively a salary dump from the Gold Coast Suns, it's a big win for Essendon. 
but they need to improve their form to uh, have me convinced. Then Hawthorne played St Kilda at the MCG, and this may be close to the most surprising result of this round. Maybe not the most surprising, because there's a few contenders in there. It's not so much that the Saints won. I tipped Hawthorne. But for them to absolutely 69 Hawthorne by uh, by 11.5 goals, uh, that, that result, in terms of how convincing the victory was, has surprised me. I've been critical on the Saints because I believe they're capable of more. I thought their round one loss to Collingwood uh, was below par, to be honest, even though Collingwood played pretty well. I thought they were unconvincing in Perth against Fremantle as well, and I didn't catch enough of the Richmond game to really get a feel for how well they're playing. But there's absolutely no doubt, you gotta give them credit for you know smashing a Hawthorne side that has been very good this year. It appears maybe something's clicked over the last few weeks. I know conditioning was an issue perhaps last year, it certainly had some injury woes from memory too. But it all clicked, the midfield played really well, Jack Steele was fantastic as ever. Brad Hill played well with three goals and 20 possessions. And again, Max King, Really bobs up late in games for, you know, basically kicking bags in the last quarter. They've got the forward half talent to really uh, put it on the scoreboard when they're playing well. So when, when it didn't happen against St Kilda, I thought they looked really flat. But over the last couple of rounds, they finished games really strongly and are looking very dangerous. When you've got a player like Max King in that forward line, despite his young age, he's potentially a match winner. He's certainly proved that this year. So St Kilda currently sit third on the AFL ladder as I expected, and they're a side that I haven't been too hot on so far this year. So credit where it's due, they've put themselves in a really, really good position to attack finals this year. And finally, the last game of the round, I don't know if it's the most surprising result. It's probably up there with St Kilda smashing Hawthorne in the way they did and West Coast beating Collingwood. But Gold Coast get the chocolates over Carlton, a side that has historically played fairly well against them. Uh, they get the job done by five goals in their home game at Metricon Stadium. And this is the uh, the harshest of reality checks for a Carlton side that people were talking up as a premiership contender. I didn't quite maybe have them quite on that level. Maybe I saw the potential for that. But for me they look absolutely a final side. So to go down by five goals against a side that doesn't really look too threatening on the final eight, in my opinion, it's a pretty interesting result. And we may have to look at perhaps why. And Pitney was laid out for this game and then you know, compound that with a Patrick Cripps hamstring injury and suddenly their clearance dominance takes a big hit with uh, without their first choice Ruckman. Tom DeConing was well held by Jared Witts, as you'd expect, a very big, mature and accomplished Ruckman. And without their premier on baller, Paddy Cripps. Uh, they looked a bit impotent, to be honest, and Gold Coast have finally gotten a bit more reward for some of the football they've played this year. They got the job done over West Coast in round one. What can you make of that? Not too sure, but we can't take any credit away from them for beating Carlton by five goals in this game. For the Blues, I think you can forgive them an off day. It's not the worst result in the world, and they're still well and truly in touch with the top eight, and I would expect them to stay in touch with the top eight all of this year, but perhaps they need to review, are they a little bit too one-dimensional? If they're disadvantaged at stoppage situations, suddenly do they have other avenues to, to win games? I'm sure they'll find a way, but at the moment, it's a fair question. That's all I got for you for this round, guys. That is uh, round four's reaction, I guess, and uh, we'll be back next week with round five. I will do the uh, footy tipping video on Wednesday as well, and uh, I've sort of made a little mini tradition now where I do a power rankings every five rounds of the AFL season. So that will be due on the channel next week. And gee, it's going to be tough. There's been some conflicting results this year. Carlton have looked fantastic. They've been beaten by the Gold Coast Suns, who beat West Coast, who beat Collingwood. St Kilda lost to Collingwood, who lost to West Coast, who lost to Gold Coast and North. Those kinds of funny results are not new to football. That happens every year, but uh, it is it is hard genuinely to get a, a real good read on some teams. So look forward to having you for all that content as well. I'm sure we'll be doing live streams uh, this upcoming round as well. So stay tuned to the channel and I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.